My talk, I'm going to talk a little bit to make it very simple as well as, uh, you know, meaningful enough to be, you know, that it, it might be complex sometimes. But the idea is, like Einstein said, if you don't help some next door neighbor understand at a six year old level, then you don't know your subject, right? So I'm not Einstein or anything, but in whatever he said, makes really great sense to me. So I will simplify it. So the first thing is the SS, I divide these days my work into A, B, C, D. As simple as that. A is assessment, B is brain function and explaining what brain does to families. C is chemistry or chemical intervention and treatment for these children. D is dynamics and delivery because every single person and family is so different and when you're treating you have to reach out to the specifics of the, that family's needs, those people's dynamics, right? Um, so for the assessment, I think the clinical translation, I think, is the purpose-driven work that I am engaged in, and I want to make it meaningful, right? So I will talk to you about affect dysregulation. The reason I chose also affect uh, bipolar disorder is one thing, uh, although I gave myriads of uh, reasons why I chose bipolar disorder. One of the fascinating reason is this is a disorder model that really lends itself to understanding affective neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience in a human model. And that helped me to understand the brain and how the networks work together and how we understand emotional and cognitive function in conjunction. So I'll tell you what the kids are like when I see the bipolar children. Um, they are they sometimes present with um, sort of depression. Uh, then you give serotonin reuptake inhibitors and suddenly they become manic and some of them like have very heavy makeups, they buy, they become hypersexual, touch other people's private parts or you know, uh, you know, which is with a qualitative change. They sometimes have, um, you know, like I know of a kid who wanted the teacher to you know do oral sex for two dollars and you know the kids um, the, you know it's just really really sad stories you know one of them wanted to grow up and do a pole dancer you know like you know these are like constantly sad stories of you know the reason I give hypersexual examples is they're facts. If I say they're grandiose, they say, oh, your kids can't be grandiose, they're factious, you know. So there are so many cluster of symptoms that kind of hang together that are so uh, bipolar um, specific, you know. And uh, there is one kid who I uh, had a um, email, uh, 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 queen of universe uh, at AOL.com. And, you know, some of them think that, you know, they think they're Egyptian kings. Some of them kind of say crazydude.com, you know, like something like that. So they're constantly, they're, they're different, different, it's endless uh, examples. Like one kid yesterday wanted to lift 200 pound weight thinking he is very, very strong. So these are like constant pushes of these patients that tell you that they're real bipolar patients, yeah? And then, uh, and then, of course, they have this uh, mixed episode, and then you treat them, they develop tolerance, you give alternatives, and then they get better, and then they get another episode. So this yellow part is the ADHD symptoms. Uh, they present chronically in between. So almost you get the idea that this is a chronic illness because of this morbidity of ADHD, plus these affective storms are little storms in between, and they may be clustered in manic episodes but they're also present when you see a brother chasing a sister in the kitchen with a knife and they get admitted to emergency room because of this, but that's not bipolar disorder by itself, right? They need to have all the other symptoms. Yeah, and then when you, tr you know, this is a narrow phenotype if there is a waxing and waning despite some uh, uh, con continuous illness. And then when you don't have enough length uh, symptoms for a long period of time, or if you have them for a short period of time, but not all the symptoms are present, they're bipolar and related disorders, either short by some uh, duration or, or duration or by symptoms. And you know, the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is nothing but chronic irritability with severe tantrums up to three, four times a week with severe temper outbursts and they don't have depression so much and 
they don't have all the cluster of symptoms of bipolar disorder. But remember that this DMDD is also present in a lot of these patients with bipolar disorder as an underlying almost like a personality disorder. So you see DMDD is present, but it's sort of that flavor is underlying these patients and you have bipolar overlay on it is a very common thing. So it's very difficult to separate and call it as bipolar if you don't see the waxing and waning and severe cluster of symptoms. So it's an art to understand and just be careful with your diagnosis. So being at the same, first thing we do in our treatment is being on the same page. You have a symptom list that you make and you frequency, intensity, number, and duration of symptoms, you completely understand them. And then you give them almost like, kids almost give a name like an invisible quest or a ghost or something that just like a cloak that bothers them. And you develop a signature of an individual person, you know, ups, downs, then a little space, and then they just get rapid cycling. So it's like a wayward clinical illness. And then, and then there is, what we call a brain disorder. So despite all these symptoms and names we give and signatures and find the intensities and examples and everything, ultimately it's a brain disorder. So that's why it fits into your neurodevelopmental model in the Mind Institute because it is a brain disorder. Um, so, you know, these are the 12 things that I'm, I don't want to overwhelm you. One, two, three, four, four, threes or 12. I'm going to talk to you about these 12 little bits today. Day. Um, you know, so what I will talk is about the assessment, then emotion processing and treatment of affect regulation, then resp face response to acute emotional reactivity, and then how do you treat it with poise and mindfulness, and then there is attention and response inhibition, and how do you treat this domain with medication, and then interface of emotion and cognition and executive function uh, a task probe, and then how do you treat it with medication during that task, and then interface of emotion and cognition using working memory, how do you treat it with medication during working memory uh, task or medication effects during working memory task and then the pharmacotherapy algorithm and rainbow the overall treatment paradigm in the daily clinics based on this experience okay so I'll just give you so five minutes each if it's 60 minutes right so I don't know <laughs> let's do it uh, so let's do first the neurocognitive function, hemodynamics, resting state, dynamic causal modeling, and education. These are like the ones I put together only because there are different ways of looking at pathophysiology of the brain function in affect dysregulated children who are bipolar, who have bipolar disorder, right? And um, why is this an urgent problem? It's very important because. Um, even with medications or symptomatic recovery, nothing has made a difference. See, these are healthy controls at baseline, the blue line, and you can see the domains in neurocognitive function that we tested, executive function, attention, verbal memory, that is what teachers teach in the classrooms, visual memory, visuospatial skills, motor, and working memory. You know the ones that are affected the most in unmedicated patients are this pink line, medicated ones are the yellow line, despite medication or despite them being not ill or ill, made absolutely no difference. And executive function, attention, verbal memory, and working memory are the ones that are worst affected in these patients. And what is important is in the, the inconvenient truth here is neurocognitive problems are not going away, okay? Here is a healthy control Z-score. After three years, this is what, they all improved in all these domains, whereas the executive function, which is planning, organization, forward thinking, uh, which is planning, flexibility, and prob you know all these kinds of um, uh, uh, organizational planning, problem solving things related to executive function or attention, verbal memory, working memory, in these patients at, at baseline are way below the Z-score and after three years they barely caught up with the baseline of healthy controls three years before. You see what I mean? So basically this attention improved a bit and working memory improved a bit because they were on stimulants. But executive function 
and verbal memory are the strongest stubborn things. Anybody who is in psychology and doing this neurocognitive test understand that they go together, they're just stubborn. They may not be specific for bipolar disorder, but they definitely are very strong and very difficult to treat. And then these bipolar patients are not able to also adopt to be flexible. Uh, Gorindo and, uh, and their colleagues in NIMH intramural program have done this flexibility task of uh, probabilistic reversal learning 80-20. Uh, and then they showed that the errors they made and learning new patterns and moving on is worse in bipolar disorder patients relative to controls. Um, so, and they also showed, uh, is Brandon Rich also from the same group, showed that effective Posner paradigm that they're easily frustrated and in win-lose uh, uh, situation when they lost money, they got really frustrated and um, sim uh, these are bipolar ones, uh, you know, where reaction time is increased because of arousal and also when they rigged the task and they lost uh, uh, the game, then they still continue to be um, um, uh, frustrated and significantly worse. So uh, both intramural program and our program have collectively shown that neurocognitive function and, uh, 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 is poor with incredible frustration when they are losing things and they're not able to adapt. Now, how are we teaching uh, this about the brain for these patients? How are we educating them about the brain? So, you know what, this is the golden age of neuroscience um, uh, now, and so we are taking the advantage of what is out to learn about brain and decode it for those people who need to understand it, right? And uh, uh, Farid Zakari, of course, encourages us every Sunday a little bit, right? And <laughs> so some credit goes to him because I heard him say, let's do the moon shots. Um, so anyway, window into the brain. Um, this is the one I, I want to show you, oriented to you, who is not doing these brain studies uh, on a daily basis. I want to explain a few details about the brain and how I think about it anyway for even if you are doing the brain thing. So this being the half section of the brain, uh, so what I feel is CEOs of cognition or brain are in the front end. Uh, the, the, where the Mickey Mouse ears are here, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is almost like the CEO of problem solving, concentration, to say quick and dirty way. And then there is a medial prefrontal cortex on the medial side of the brain, much more involved in thinking, rumination, and you know processing information. Uh, and then there is orbitofrontal cortex here that is involved in reward processing and decision making. And then there is ventrolateral prefrontal cortex at the bottom of the brain here on either side that is involved in emotional control as well as impulse control. So it has a dual function of impulse control and emotional control. So this is like, holds the reins of emotion, in other words. So all these CEOs of the brain are at the front in the prefrontal cortex. And then the middle managers are the cingulate, where there is a dorsal cingulate that's invo involved in cognition, and the ventral cingulate, the pregenual cingulate, and then the insula is right behind the VLPFC that tells you how your body is experiencing the emotional arousal and then there is the amygdala that receives the uh, in information um, fr from any um, uh, stimuli that are emotional and re gets reactive. And there's also the nucleus accumbens or ventral striatum that is at the ventral part of the basal ganglia that's involved in uh, 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 cognitive control as well as uh, in frontostriatal circuits involved in emotion as well as response inhibition. So, and also, um, you know, I call these uh, nucleus accumbens amygdala all these basal ganglia structures as frontline workers, whereas all these uh, frontal areas are like CEOs and the cingulate is like a middle manager. Sometimes it takes over, it's involved in error control. And precuneus and, uh, and the other uh, areas like insula and all these PFC regions, they're all hubs of the brain. They're very important parts of the brain that are involved in various uh, functions of cognition and emotion, okay? So with that background, I would like to tell you a little bit more 
Oh, this one is a bit insular. I, I, I kind of like the insular a lot because um, what is important for me in understanding insula is how the uh, subjective intensity of experience and perception are experienced by insula and posterior insula increases the awareness and subjective intensity of experience and perception are felt by anterior insula and then it talks to the ACC and medial PFC. So you, you see all these dots, VLPFC or ventrolateral prefrontal cortex insula that helps you feel the body's arousal and also the ACC all share one economo neurons and no wonder that the, the brain lights up a lot, VLPFC and insula light up simultaneously a lot of the time, you know. So this is kind of an interesting thing to think about and this is also closely connected to central nucleus of amygdala, thalamus, motor cortex and there are dynamic updates constantly. So I would love, allow for us to think more and more deeply into the details of every part of the brain as you're processing the information and understanding and decoding, even when you're giving medications for children. Otherwise, there's no um, rhyme or reason as to why you even give guanfacine, for example, that it calms down this uh, autonomic nervous system. You give clonidine all the time with patients and uh, propranolol sometimes. Some of these things are to just calm down this insula. And I'll also tell you uh, a, a lot more about how medications engage various parts of the brain. So affective hemodynamic probe is one of the um, things, uh, probes that we uh, did. It's an event-related paradigm uh, by one of my postdocs that showed that DLPFC, the, uh, with the fearful faces, DLPFC showed very prolonged curve of hemodynamic um, course where, and uh, also um, the amygdala is very late to the choir and it stayed prolonged, the broken line with fearful faces. And also, um, you know, uh, some other labs have shown amygdala abnormality of increased surface area with um, uh, uh, with actually smaller amygdala and in the right uh, 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 sorry, basolateral amygdala on bilaterally in bipolar disorder uh, and smaller in size compared to healthy controls and also compared to high risk uh, population in Stanford. So this is the uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, evidence is coming uh, even on the surface area com and in small nuclear regions spe specified further compared to just even talking about the amygdala being smaller consistently in bipolar disorder. Um, so how ready are we, uh, uh, how ready to engage are these resting state networks? Uh, when you look at these resting state networks, you, uh, the three, uh, in using independent component analysis, three resting state networks have emerged. They are affective, executive, and sensory motor networks. What is fascinating is in connectivity, uh, in the affective circuitry, the anterior, remember I told you the middle managers like right and left anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, the emotional area, they are all highly connected along with amygdala within affective circuit and in executive circuit also the same regions are connected. So it's almost like in cognitive and emotional interface, you can see how one action that, engage, that engages in executive circuit such as ACC could also spill into the emotional uh, aspect of op dynamic operations and in the same way with insula. So that is like the nexus of how uh, the cognitive and emotional areas are interconnected. And also in bipolar kids, there is a motor axis with resting state increased connectivity that you see here. There are a lot of night terrors that you see in these patients, a lot of hyperactivity, motor activity. Um, and we don't know exact significance. We haven't measured clinically these things, but I think that this is uh, sensory motor integration problems are very high in these patients, so I'm not surprised. So even at resting state, these regions are uh, impaired. And in fact, higher executive function using brief is correlated highly with um, the uh, amygdala connectivity in these patients.
And using dynamic causal modeling, you know, it's nothing but you know increased no, no centrality of the node, uh, or the pathway or o is overused through a certain area of the brain, such as amygdala. Uh, it's an easy way to say, you know, like going to New York, shortest distance is through Boston, then from Chicago, then it's overused, right? The Boston path. In the same way, the node centrality in amygdala as well as temporal pole and precuneus is greater in these patients with bipolar disorder and lowered in prefrontal areas here. As you can see here, the prefrontal areas are not engaged. So even in resting state using this dynamic causal modeling of complex connectivity, the same areas are being shown as being affected, right? And so the labels mean only so much. You know, there is a working memory problem, impulse control, executive function, I told you all about those. And then the psychiatrists keep calling them as ADHD, bipolar disorder, anxiety, autism. And then academics call it reading disorder, writing, math, spelling. And then parents say, oh, they're not listening. They're failing in the class, excessive worrying, bullying, not enjoying play days. They're just being explosive. So, we have to you know, sit down with these families and slowly explain on a little piece of paper how they're all like Venn diagrams in one tier, another tier, another tier, and another. And their labels mean only so much and how they're all interconnected and what kind of help is necessary to take care of them. So this is the part of psychoeducation that we want to be involved in. And I also use a lot of the time uh, just take a little cards and explain to them about how these things are connected and how they are these uh, uh, CEOs and the frontline workers. And then I say how the dorsal parts are on there and the ventral parts are at the bottom of the brain and the threat and trust knob with the insula. And you know, you can explain how the reward system, the substance abuse is very common with bipolar disorder with OFC and nucleus accumbens being impacted. Some of these stories of some of these literature findings can be decoded at a simple level that makes sense to why my child, why, my, why is this happening? And it's not like I'm telling your brain is impacted. All I'm saying is educating them about what has been published and what could be relevant and why. Instead of taking the blame off the child, at the same time, of course, you want to help the family in every possible way. And this is kind of like another of my little translation just to show the clinical people here, how we kind of translate this brain uh, in educating is that these are the prefrontal cortices, these are the subcortical areas, sometimes the executive function is low, then the effort uh, is put, uh, lo there's lower motivation, so we need to decrease, they don't put so much effort. So a third is patient's effort, it, uh, helping them from how you kind of mindful and not yell and scream. A third is medications, a third is a tutor in decreasing the weight, increasing the health in the wagon, at the backpack, and then so that the motivation is increased. So you have to decode these things very carefully. Otherwise, what's the point of your discovery of prefrontal cortex? What is your point of understanding your amygdala dysfunction? We have to understand how people modulate their you know, faculties, understand the workload of these kids, and in detail, tell them why we need to do what we need to do to make a difference in their children. Uh, otherwise, they'll think they're lazy, they're not you know, doing, pulling themselves together, they yell and scream, and medications they think are useless. So I think that these are the kinds of things that we need to be committed as scientists and clinicians. So effect emotion processing, oh well, this is the brain emerging model, so this is like a, ba each, each kind of line is a study that we have done. This is frontal limbic circuit, this is like face response circuitry, and then occipital limbic associative circuit for reaction, frontal striatal circuits, and interface circuits. I'll talk to you in a in a brief way, you know, so that I can explain. So we showed them these faces, um, uh, uh, neutral, and then these angry faces probing the emotions. And it is the angry faces that led to this increased amygdala activity in patients relative to healthy controls. 
and also the prefrontal cortex regions are shut off. See, when they see angry stimuli, the prefrontal cortex is uh, underactive, whereas amygdala is overactive. And that's what we showed here, VLPFC underactivity and amygdala overactivity in euthymic unmedicated patients, the frontal limbic circuit. So similar to Dr. Emerald's monkey studies, where he has shown the negative stimuli were powerful in el eliciting amygdala activity. Yeah, so what is the treatment? Uh, I feel that there several of us are attempting, and I'll show my work in a minute, but this is one of the multi-site studies through Pittsburgh where um, there's a, they showed that in bipolar patients, the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, or the emotional control area I told you, that has shown increased activation from not at being active at all. Their activation is increased once the uh, once they separated medicated versus unmedicated people. So the medicated people showed slightly increased uh, VLPFC activity, whereas that is shut off in unmedicated patients. So um, there's a value for medications. This is another very small psychotherapy intervention study in patients uh, with effect regulation, that family-focused uh, uh, family therapy where they showed increased DLPFC, uh, which has been recently recently published. So there are psychotherapeutic interventions, medications that are being developed towards effect regulation. Um, so face response circuit and emotional reactivity, I mean, I showed you that when you showed angry faces also, the occipital cortex in healthy controls was intact, whereas uh, it is underactive in bipolar patients. So is the, see occipital cortex where you see the shapes and you know, shapes and colors, and then uh, fusiform gyrus here that you can recognize the faces, and then the superior temporal sulcus that decodes the emotions and sends them to amygdala. So this face response circuit also discovered by Dr. Emerald in monkeys, we have also shown in kids here, uh, exact same circuit. Um, so this circuit is the one, sometimes a dash of these patients don't decode social skills and cues and are in the face and intrusive, not only because of over energy, but they just like a little clumsy. So these are the patients that need help in social skills. Um, so then, the, there is, and then we showed the faces uh, that uh, that we when we and asked the kids to show whether they're over 35 or under 35, and then we showed positive faces and asked them to show whether they're positive or negative. So this is direct emotional recognition. There is indirect, sneaky, incidental emotions are what we ask uh, we we expose them to. When they're sneaky, then the amygdala got really activated. It's a little bit like the teacher saying, "Get down now! Come on, do your math now! What are you doing? So, uh, you know what? If you don't." finish, then you're going to get a bad grade. Did you hear me? Uh, or things like that would just, you know, not own the words, but even if you say, sit down now, you know? So there is that kind of like, oh my gosh, she hates me, you know? Oh my gosh, she's like not really good, you know, I'm not liked. You know, so those are the emotions that really shuts your cognitions down, and they are, their amygdala is very hyperactive. So that's very important treatment implications for, for us to think about uh, that I always tell that always choose a compassionate kindergarten teacher versus a structured one even if your kid is hyperactive. That's because the reactive kids like this better environment, I think. So these are like something that we need to really be uh, cognizant. So the occipital limbic circuit, this is the same one that Ledoux and all those people um, have published in monkeys from the posterior circuit where the amygdala lights up within 40 milliseconds, so we showed that faces for less than 200 milliseconds, by the way, and we were able to show the amygdala activity with incidental, but not directed emotion. So another clinical point is directed emotion. You can label the emotion, then you're more in control. If you don't understand the emotion and label them, then there's a problem, okay? So there's a lot of clinical points nested in this issue. So what we developed was the poise and mindfulness. 
treatment. As a result, this is I am taking this uh, effect regulation module to Chicago charter schools, um, and we call it Amazing Start in Chicago. You know, um, and so I wrote the curriculum for the classes because teachers are all stressed out, and so we kind of uh, try to educate them. Kids, we are trying to educate the kids about the brain and tuning them into facial emotions like the girl faces and building skills to think under the stress of negativity like cognitive structuring, teaching them mindfulness to regulate emotions, and then preparing teachers to understand the brain as well. See, environmental training, remember I told you better, you know, which is like brain resilience building also through environment. See, the environment, the people have to wrap around these children, be affectionate and tolerate their idiosyncrasies, understand their emotional systems. So it's very important, I think, to teach the teachers to understand the brain functions and be cognizant and compassionately envelop the children and create the optimal environment instead of misunderstanding the children, right? So you're taking care of teachers by educating them, you're helping them to be nice, and you're helping the kids to be mindful, control their anger, and then think under stress and tune into emotions. And they also learn about brain and then draw pictures of brain. There is like my first book on brain, you know, they buy a copy, tear off copies and then. So do that. So that's like an important one and I named it poise because I like the word poise. So the other one, we're doing some mindfulness work. The basis for mindfulness is that when you do a rumination task, then they ruminate with increased blood flow in orbitofrontal, uh, sorry, medial prefrontal cortex. Remember the uh, uh, medial prefrontal cortex here? And then uh, also in the posterior cingulate cortex, but when you distract or do mindfulness training, then uh, they just go down, uh, the rumination goes down. Uh, but also, we, did, we finished meta-analysis, which we're gonna publish soon. Uh, and when we did the meta-analysis of all the stop signal tasks in pediatric bipolar disorder, what we found was that amygdala response was lowered and cognitive res, you know, areas lighted up. See, when you distract people away from negativity and think about something reasonable to do, then you know you say, oh, go on, look at that ice cream man, you know, or something like that. You know, they kind of go on to concentrate on something else, right? That is true. These kids, there are so many interesting things we can teach these children by doing these mind tricks, or like the Mind Institute, it's kind of cute, right? <laughs> so the mind tricks of distract them uh, uh, towards um, uh, uh, more productive cognitive tasks um, through. So what do we do with mindfulness? You know, I read and read and read because mindfulness is not taught when I was young, although it's very, very old technique. So I listened to all the videos and read all the books and I think that I'm such a cognitive person despite emotional work that I do and if it doesn't engage me, I feel sitting still and meditating and letting thoughts roll didn't ap appeal to me as much. But when I really understand the mindfulness, I really thought it's the one for me. You know what I mean? It is, you sit still, but you listen. You listen and you focus. You become aware. Let thoughts flow without judging is what they say. Be in touch with all the senses. Focus on breathing. It slows down the thinking. Um, and uh, annoying or disturbing triggers can remind us uh, to refocus on breathing. And like Thich Nhat Hanh says, as, as you smile in, you breathe out, you know? And there's a deep, what is more interesting is, you imagine yourself like two eyes of yours looking at yourself, like a clock, and then um, you look at yourself and then your emotions are like these waves, and there's a deep sea under these waves that really give you insight into your own thoughts and feelings provided you wait and listen and experience those deep insights underneath those emotional top waves, which are actually nothing compared to how much more you can salvage about yourself and your life and your insights and uh, you know the 
the, the nuances of life. So that is what is called listening and discovering those nuggets. So I think that the mindfulness could be a one way, a tool that we can integrate. We are integrating also into a rainbow program, which I'll tell you later, um, is that this, this is uh, very good for affect regulation. Um, so what we did with attention and response inhibition. Now moving on to that. Um, so we did the stop signal task. So, um, so th those are the airplanes that come in the stop sign that comes you stop. And then what we showed was we gave them lamotrigine and there is increased prefrontal cortex activity and subgenual and pregenual anterior cingulate activity, ventral striatum, they're all increased in activity with frontostriatal improvement uh, 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 in operation correlating with improvement in um, impulse control in these patients with bipolar disorder. So the cognitive circuits um, are also engaged and impaired and uh, can be fixed with treatment. And we also did the interface of thinking and feeling uh, where we showed the words like jerk, nasty, and stupid and asked them to kind of, you know, uh, do the matching that's cognitive task while these negative words are interfering. And what happened was the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and ventrolateral prefrontal cortex where Petridis and Pandya have told, told about how they're all so integrated and together at the front, they became like uh, sort of blue here because they were, the blood flow, they just basically switched off, whereas healthy controls were not affected by these, this task. So you can almost say that how these patients are impacted by negative stimuli in the prefrontal cortex and ACC kind of compensated as being the intermediary cortex. Yeah, and so this, this thinking and feeling is a little bit like me going to the oral exams and then your brain is shut off and getting all anxious, you know? And uh, you, 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 know, you are still passing the exam because you're kind of normal. But if you just are totally spin out, then that is something really dangerously sad, right? And so that's kind of why these bipolar patients are impacted by it. So the pharmacotherapy, then let's talk about, um, uh, the uh, intervention and where medications made a difference with these. Um, so I'll go on to using the same paradigms, but look at where the medications help the brain function, okay? So the pharmacotherapy algorithm, basically before starting these neuroscience programs, I started uh, a program to make sure that my patients are getting all the right treatments, that is prescription hygiene stopping serotonin reuptake inhibitors, mood stabilization, then helping problem solve with psychosis, aggression, depression, treatment resistance, sleep difficulties, adverse events, and then address also comorbid conditions. Uh, all these things are very, very important in a systematic way in algorithm uh, for bipolar patients. It's not like linear in a way you do this, then you do this, then you do this, it doesn't work because 20 things hit your children all at once. So you have to organize yourself to carefully uh, help address each aspects of treatment. But first thing is to clean up bad drugs and then go to mood stabilization, then you can do it. The MD pass is just a mood, depression, uh, mania, depression, psychosis, attention, aggression, sleep, tracking each session as you treat them. So problem solving algorithm is what it is. So optimizing the function, normalizing, remodeling, brain, brain plasticity, all this is the name of the game these days, right? And so we also wanted to do that. And we showed that with, we did the double blind uh, uh, placebo controlled uh, double dummy design comparing Risperidon and Divalprox over six weeks in these patients and using um, the uh, multiple uh, paradigms, uh, same ones, but in a different, we use, I showed before, but in different sample uh, in order to replicate the baseline results as well as treatment outcome, okay? So we, with independent competent analysis, we showed evaluative effective inhibitory circuit. Uh, and in that circuit, um, basically Risperidon engaged the insula and Divalprix engaged the subgenual cingulate cortex with 
which correlated with the YMRS change and also this one correlated also being the mood stabilizer, and, you know, uh, child depression rating scale uh, score decrease um, with this. So there is a differential engagement of these two drugs through different parts of the brain. But what is interesting is that amygdala is engaged poorly even after the treatment here. See how the people get better, but the amygdala, they're also react to all the time, right? These bipolar patients. So the amygdala doesn't calm down, like it's that old reptilian brain that just doesn't shut up, you know? So it's just on and on and on. So what happened was that, you know, uh, so in the rest, uh, with longer treatment, it, it just got better, but I'll show you a little bit. So in response, inhibition task, we use various medications, right? So with lamotrigine, it's one trial. With lamotrigine, same task. It increased all these areas, DLPFC, medial PFC, VLPFC, subgenual anterior cingulate, pregenual anterior cingulate, ventral striatum, posterior cingulate. They all showed increased activity and change over time compared to healthy controls except striatum. So everything has showed increased activity. Again, in another study, these red circles are the circuits that emerged with the best beta fit with independent component analysis. So the so same regions are involved in it, and divalproex showed increased connectivity in effective inhibitory circuit from baseline to patients in subgenual cingulate and insula, as I showed just before, the risperidone increased connectivity in this area in the same circuit. So the same regions are engaged by all these drugs with specific emphasis on certain regions within that circuit, okay? So there is something consistent that we are seeing. And emotional areas are deployed during cognitive performance, see? See, this is response inhibition is a cognitive thing, but still all these emotional areas are involved in this study. So now what happened with uh, effective stroop that we did? Remember I showed you these uh, brave, rich, jerk, stupid. What happened with that, that particular thing? So um, the medial prefrontal cortex, again, is increased with lamotrigine, and risperidone increased posterior cingulate, uh, sorry, pregenual and subgenual anterior cingulate with, with a different um, uh, uh, paradigm with a negative emotional challenge. That's why the emotional areas are engaged here. And divalproex engaged also prefrontal cortex and medial temporal lobe. You know, relative to healthy controls, only medial temporal, but within group, it's also did the prefrontal. So it's almost like um, these areas are increased similar to the previous uh, 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 paradigm, similar areas of, uh, uh, of brain are engaged. See, what is interesting here is here, lamotrigine is very good for anxious, neurotic young women who kind of cover their hood and just like with all these rings and tattoos and, you know, all kinds of, you know, black hood, don't talk and shut themselves off, you know, like very, very sad. Those are the kinds of kids who are just oppositional and making a statement. They do really well with lamotrigine, you know, like anxious kids with bipolar disorder. So, I mean, they ruminate, ruminate, and very depressive, a lot of type 2 bipolar. So it's interesting that medial prefrontal cortex keeps coming up as a very specific thing for lamotrigine. And again, lamotrigine decreases post-treatment, but increases change towards lower activity versus healthy controls. Lamotrigine and risperidone also engage DLPFC exactly the same way. And also, right amygdala is increased activity is still present post-treatment, but, incre but increased connectivity post-algorithm in a longer term. If you give four to six months of treatment, they, they have show better engagement. So what you see here is prefrontal cortex changes first with normalized activity of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, ventrolateral, and medial prefrontal cortex on short treatment, followed by amygdala on long-term treatment. So it takes a long time before they calm down at a very fundamental level. 
So recovered patients, you know, we showed that um, bipolar responders showed increased connectivity with frontal limbic circuit over time also in another sample completely. So um, with working memory, what happened again? Another paradigm trying to remember two faces back and keep doing that in the paradigm. So what happened with those, again, to optimize therapy is same areas with lamotrigine increased the ruminating medial prefrontal cortex improved as well as emotional control area and medial temporal cortex post treatment relative to healthy controls and then divalprox also engaged the same regions see how wonderful to show that two neuroleptics with two different samples did exactly the same thing as the other drugs. So there is a replication among anti-epileptic drugs. So, you know, and Risperidone, of course, engaged a subgenual cingulate here, similar to the previous uh, interface task with emotion involved. So now you can see why we targeted all these areas, developed this model first, and then used in different sample medications, and retraced these and saw that we could reverse the dysfunction in these regions. You see what I mean? That is what is brain plasticity, treatment, normalization, and recovery with medication to some extent, okay? And then, what we did, I showed you about the dynamics. Uh, uh, dynamics are very important, though brain and environmental training. Begin with bringing the best in the child. The most important thing is working with the self-esteem of the child, bringing the very best that the child has within themselves. And I feel that the nature and nurture come together here, that is the brain and the people. And people are to manage, you have to manage the children, the partners, the school, family, friends, child's peers, siblings. It's no different than business done with much love. You know, I tell them, mothers, you know, go manage your husband, or I tell my husbands to manage your wives, you know. So it's sort of like we're all in people's business, right? I mean, you got to manage them. So once, long, long time ago, my supervisor told me in child psychiatry one thing, focus on the positive, ignore the negative, and special time. Whenever I forget everything, the basic knee-jerk thing is focus on the positive, right? And, and the amygdala at least shuts down. <laughs> so, um, so I feel that when you show these angry faces or negative words, the brain shuts off. So negative stimuli are the best probes to elicit dysfunction and their prognostic factors are PFC overactivity and amygdala, oh, amygdala overactivity at baseline is a bad prognosis. PFC overactivity is good prognosis because it's still plastic. And I feel that um, the, this is what Dr. Emerald also discovered with monkeys with negative stimuli activating amygdala. So I came, you know what, a lot of um, you know studies, some of them show like, oh my God, VLPFC is increased. Oh, now this study, they decreased. Oh, this is um, relative to healthy controls. So what do you make sense of it? Is increased or decreased? How do I understand these fMRI studies? You know, I kind of thought and thought, say, when I look through the fine print of all these studies, if the patients have hypomanic patients or if the school has treated manic patients when the kids are not as sick in the sample, then the VLPFC goes up in lighting. When the patients are sick, very severely manic, the VLPFC completely shuts down. Same with DLPFC. So it's almost like a rubber band. You, you push it, you push it, and it works, works, works. And then when it's so ill, then it breaks. It switches off. You know, you go look at any sample of data, and you will see this principle. Then you understand why it's up or down. This is the philosophy. It's ouch broken. So don't pull it till it breaks, they say, right? So that's exactly what this is. So what we decided was a rainbow therapy. One day we came up with this rainbow therapy. So in order to also complement for psychopharm algorithm, something really nice treatment that we could standardize and give. This is now published and in randomized clinical trial proven to be useful. R is routine, 
A is affect control. We all can do this, it's parents and children. Both of them do this treatment. I is I can do this. N is no negative, uh, like positive self stories. No is no negative thoughts. And then for parents living in the now, you know, and being a good friend, you know, how you have to supervise your child, help them to develop good social skills, not be so bossy, and balance lifestyle for parents. Oh, how can we solve it? You know, Peter Jensen said we should call it optimal problem solving. But I said, oh, how can we solve it? Because I wasn't so creative at the time. So, um, so solving is just basically problem solving when they're not very angry because you don't want to put your fan in when it is like fire. You know, you get burnt, right? So W is ways to get support. And some of these kids say, oh, Dr. Pavluri, I'll come and see you. I said, it's not possible to see me all the time, right? I mean, you know, I, I love you and everything. But you know what? You have Uncle Jim or Aunt Mary or little, you know, a Molly that you could visit or call. You know, so you have who are those in your tree of support, you know, when we develop those kinds of stuff. So this is a 12-week program that we do with our patients. It's, uh, you, you can see here, it's so funny. The RAIN is like the cognitive behavior therapy, and BOW is the interpersonal therapy. It's to do with the people, okay? And uh, also, it's based on trying to use only positivity. There's no punishment involved. It's a neuroscience-informed intervention, basically, all right? Basically based on what we discovered in the brain. So this is the randomized trial showing improvement in manic and depressive symptoms in bipolar disorder. And the game changer here is no punishment or provocative negative consequences or stimuli because they'll bang the door in your face and break the walls and, you know, you know break the for flower pots in the house if you just do. Sorry, this is something that I, I, I came back from Turkey yesterday and I just wrote something for them. What it says is that, um, um, you know, it takes a long time to break down a big tree because it, it's a long entrenched practice of negative stimuli that we do all the time. Like, oh yeah, po rewards positive and then take away the bike or that, this. Then if you say, I'll take away the bike, they'll smash your nose, you know? So there's a way to do it, there's a time to do it, there's a wisdom to do it, and it's very important to tame these people and influence them and nurture them. Because you know what, the environment is very important as much as thinking about their brain, you know? And um, so the big picture is disorder versus domains. We talked about that. Both are important. Affective and cognitive domains, they're all interconnected. And education on how the brain functions, um, intervention at the level of brain and environment, brain and experience are important. Change is primarily possible through environment versus fixed genes. Although, talking to Dr. Randy today, I decided that this epigenetics could be an interesting genetic thing. And, and I think environment, again, influences epigenetics and all those things. So we need to really unlock a lot more things, of course, but this is where we can begin. So larger longitudinal studies, chasing repair sounds promising across all settings. So we must start early, like Dr. Emerald's monkey studies where he showed that their social things were fine if they started early, right? Even though you destroyed those amygdala. So I think that we need to really start early, right? So it's almost like I sit here and think, I read all his work and also I thought about like, you know, Dr. Lane's work too on language. And we've done some language work too, which I kind of forgot to put in here. Negative language, uh, people can't remember and interpret and it's a royal road to recovery. So those those are the negative stimuli that we need to be cognizant of. So a lot of these things need to be like almost we did without, I mean, actually John Sweeney, my mentor, long, long time ago, like 10, 15 years ago, said, Mani, why are you doing all these paradigms straight away in kids? I said, look, he wanted me to do everything in adults and then transfer it to all the kids. I said, it's too much time. I mean, already I'm just like old and I can't go all these adults and then do the child. Now think about it. If I read all these monkey studies, I read some of his, but the whole data is just like replication of my kids, kids things. And I said, oh my goodness, we're all doing our own things in our own corners. And we have to bring the stories together 
and connect the monkey works and the mouse works and the language work and you know the things in the classrooms and labs, clinics together, I think, you know. So we want to use all our brain, right? And so this is a precision treatment. That's the name of the game in NIMH. These are actually all the risk factors to stop suicide that's published in the last issue of uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, I think child psychopharm. Uh, stop fighting with parents and perception of being supported, supporting the school, self-esteem, family flexibility, thinking the family supports them, family depression treated, remove the means that like uh, guns, precision medicine. So all of these are important with cognitive remediation like Julie does it here, um, and mindfulness, DBT, rainbow therapy, children, parents, SIB school. So Discovery is important, skill development is important, compassion is important. I think all three should meet in treating every individual child and their system. So like Steve Jobs says, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backward. So maybe we're okay not knowing all these different people, different people, monkey monkeys and all those studies. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. So let's connect the dots and move forward and do the best we can. I have a big thanks to our team. In fact, it would be three times the screen, but you know how it is. You put the latest names and then you forget the ones before. But you know, that's that. And this is uh, our city and that's our plaque as we enter into the clinic. It's no, mind, it's no mind institute, but it's a small lab and a clinic program that I work in UIC. And I really enjoy my work. And anybody wants any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I was very interested in, um, in what you chose for your medications. Uh, you know, we use a lot of uh, aripiprazole or Abilify, and that seems to have some very nice uh, effects. Not at a high dose, it seems to make things worse at a high dose, but at I'm, a lower yeah, I'm dose. I'm so glad you asked. I didn't bring some of the slides that I show to other people about that medication algorithm. But Abilify is my number one to go medication. You know how it is as researchers, yesterday's life is today and today's life is tomorrow. So when I did this research, Abilify did not even Exist. get FDA indication or anything like that. And Resperidol is barely came. Janssen gave, Janssen gave me seed money to begin with. Then they gave me money for NIH study and things like that. You know what I mean, how it works? So these are the drugs that are chosen for study at the time. And I had to live with five years and then another five years to write. So basically, by the time I'm done, then I don't want to do another study. But I would like to do Abilify study. But then by then, you know, somebody says, you did this IRB thing, oh, you know, what you, you just I'll take this off from you this one is that that's one. I mean this medication studies are like animal activist studies you know I mean you know people are just like it's just crazy I mean so I feel like uh, Abilify is the first choice that I use now if I have these are just to show what I've done and I haven't done all the studies I mean all the medications my algorithm is if, if my, my child is psychotic, then Abilify is the number one choice because of its partial dopamine agonism in the prefrontal cortex that helps with executive function as well as serotonin dopamine antagonism uh, for this antipsychotic effect plus antidepressant effect as well if you care about that. So the Abilify is my first choice and also Risperidone but then with you know, Medicaid, there's no Abilify on the Medicaid char chart, so we had to choose Risperidone, and then people get scared about the voice with the brass kind of advertisement, so we have to go for Giardon, which makes you really stiff, then you go to Latuda, which is not approved in kids, and then you give Latuda anyway, and then, you know, things like that. So, 
So, and what about uh, uh, lithium, which is a very old drug? Is that totally passe, or are people No, no, no. Still... Abel, if I had an NIH study of lithium effect on brain function, and then uh, I actually am funded to do that study uh, right now, except that they're giving me a little bit of trouble because some of the medications, some of the kids were, exp I said I'd recruit medication to patients, and then three or four got exposed to medications, and they knew it through an adverse event, and then they're just on it, on me at that, so God only knows what happens to that. So this is what I'm talking about. It's just really complicated because somewhere in your big lab, some people sneak in, and then by the time you just know that they even exist, then they're here. You know, so it's just like, you know, we are just struggle with it. But anyway, we'll hope to finish that. And Melissa is also doing, I'm the chair of her um, drug safety monitoring board, uh, another lithium study versus uh, uh, syrup while she's doing. So it's the studies are coming out, yeah. One is you mentioned that, that some of these symptoms could be reversed. Is that cured and is that continuing on medication or is that after medication is administered and then do you? Um, yeah, I have all kinds of patients. Uh, I have a few patients who actually recovered without medication. They're doing great. And some patients actually continue to take just lithium, one of them in college, and they come like once in six months for Christmas and take the medicines and go. That's it. And one kid stopped after college, Abilify and Lamotrigine but got back on just Abilify but not Lamotrigine because she wanted to have babies and stuff. And, um, but she couldn't hack without both of them, so she came and took one, I think, Lamotrigine or Abilify, I can't remember. One of them she chose to be back on. And uh, so there are all kinds of variables. It's so individualistic. But cure, I would say, I would tell them just like I take like a blood pressure pill or something, you just take these pills and forget about it for now, you know, especially in the transition age and do well. And you can always try coming off when you're feeling stable emotionally and life is good. You know, nobody, nobody says it's a life sentence that you should be on medications. You should have every chance to try without it. But I would, um, I would um, try, you know go on and off and whatever. I'm willing to try. But I would like to say uh, cure if they're having a good time and forget that they're ill, regardless of medication. And my other question is hopefully mm -hmm. uh, easy and kind of quick. At what age do you feel like you could have a positive diagnosis of bipolar? Oh, around six, seven, I could do that if I have the right symptoms and stuff. Where we could find rainbow, the rainbow therapy, if it's nearby? In this uh, area. I don't know. I would say, I mean, I don't mean to shamelessly tell about my book, but I wrote that no, I one book, it. What yeah. Works for Bipolar Kids. Yeah. That has the details of how you implement it. You buy one and give it to your therapist. You know, who said that they can't just do some of the good stuff okay. in the book? Yeah. And then my um, faculty are going to uh, write a manual. Uh, a, exact manual based on the thing, but the, but the, they haven't started, you know, so the book itself is good enough, you yeah. know, okay. to, I mean, I got all the principles. Yeah. Okay. It's Amazon.com. It's a great book. It's oh, you got yeah. that? Yeah, it's okay. a well. And then Geodon, how do you feel about Geodon? How do you feel about it? Oh, Giron, you know, because of all these not having other choices readily available, uh, I use Giron uh, for weight loss. Um, especially the, that doesn't cause weight loss, and then I could give once a day dose, uh, even though half life is short, it just catches up around 80 milligrams to, or so, and give cogentin more often because it causes stiffness a lot, and it could cause occasionally manic um, excitement because uh, because of its elevating effect, but it doesn't often, so don't worry about that. But Chiron is a good drug, but it's not as efficacious as Abilify or Risperdal. But it could be. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I liked your uh, analogy with the rubber band and the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex being broken. And, and the chart that you had up that said many of the presenting behaviors overlap with, say, autism presentation or ADHD type presentation. I'm wondering about your experience with kids coming in that are on stimulant medication with yeah. bipolar disorder. Yeah. 
Um, uh, the, the, uh, that is a great one. We actually did like another deck of my slides would be ADHD versus bipolar studies that we published. Um, what we found in those patients is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is more affected in ADHD than bipolars and VLPFC is more affected in, AD, in, in bipolar patients. But both are affected in both which is why Russell Barkley and other people talk about emotion dysregulation in ADHD, and we talk about cognitive dysfunction in bipolar disorder. And basically, if you think brain, the dorsal being in quick and dirty way to say, because everybody would, you know, here might think I'm crazy if I say otherwise. The dorsal is all cognitive, ventral is all emotional, mostly predominantly a lot of the time, right? So if you have the ventral stuff broken, bipolar-ish, top one broken, ADHD-ish, and they all overlap because they're all connected all over the place, parietal, ventral, striatum, in, impacted for emotion cognition, you know, singulate like that. So treatment wise, I would do mood stabilizers first and then I would give long acting focalin or um, Adderall or Vyvanse, Vyvanse because it's really good. It doesn't have the peaks and flows and it's got better for not being addictive, not that others are addictive, but it has less street value. Vyvanse as a, uh, as a thing, but they're all like powerful marijuana top seeds. So Concerta and Focalin are a little bit less powerful compared to Adderall or Dexamphetamine, mixed amphetamine salts. So I would do those and I would always prefer one daily dose, long acting in the morning and occasionally a small four o'clock for homework, but I try not to do too much of the middle of the day drugs. The morning ones, um, yeah, I mean, I, I choose Concerta and Focalin only because I don't want to overdo the stimulants and bipolars, but always after stimulants. But they're not as bad as SSRI stimulants do help with that comorbid cognitive inattention in these patients because you have to treat them because no matter what the diagnosis is, they have all these other problems, but it's a sequence that matters. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.